if you've been in urban parts of Ontario at all in the past few years, you'll have encountered an increasingly popular way to get around, e-bikes. They're fast, but not too fast, more affordable than a car. Are they the way of the future? Let's get a fuller picture with, in Hamilton, Ontario, Jamie Stuckless, independent transportation consultant with Stuckless Consulting, Inc. And in Ontario's capital city, Darnell Harris, executive director of Our Greenway, a micro transportation advocacy organization. Hi to you both. Hello. So I was talking to a few friends about the segment and I didn't realize how polarizing a conversation about e-bikes is and how invested a lot of people are in e-bikes. So it's great to have you on the program to give us a sort of primer of what e-bikes are and the issues around them. Um, Jamie, I wanted to start with you. I'm gonna bring up some pictures and you can both explain to us. Uh, so we're gonna bring up a picture. This is a pedal assist or throttled e-bike. It looks very similar to the bike that I have in the garage. Uh, Jamie, can you um, explain this bike for us? Absolutely, sure. So yeah, this is, uh, as you said, a bicycle style e-bike, sometimes known as a pedal assist or a throttle assist e-bike. And essentially it has a, the same frame and set up design as what we may consider a traditional bicycle, but it's got that extra uh, motor that you can see sitting above the wheel that uh, provides an electric assist um, to help you travel further or faster or for longer while you're riding your bike. See, this is what I need because my husband is a very fast cyclist and my I'm not as physically fit as he is, so I think that would be my kind of speed. Um, we're gonna bring up another picture, and this is the scooter style. Jamie, can you explain to us what we're seeing? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, what we might call like a moped style or a scooter style e-bike. And for a really long time, under a federal definition that was just repealed last year, uh, both this style of you know scooter style e-bike and the pedal assist e-bike were considered under the same definition of power assisted bicycle in Canada. And so it was causing a lot of confusion about what are we actually talking about when we're talking about e-bikes? Because one person could be picturing the first picture and the second person could be picturing the second person and they have very different you know capacities as vehicles uh, because when i see the scooter style in my my brain says motorcycle but it's not um, yes and uh, there is a, a move right now, as I mentioned, the federal government has recently repealed the definition that lumped them all together. And here in Ontario, uh, the MOMS Act this summer sought to distinguish between bicycle style e-bikes and motorcycle style e-bikes. Um, we have another one. And uh, Darnell, if you can explain to us what we're seeing, this is our cargo e-bike and it's used for deliveries. Yes, this is a Coaster Cycles e-bike and it's used for mail by Canada Post. It's part of a pilot they have running in the city of Montreal. And, and certainly a lot of cargo bikes like this are wonderful for, for commerce, package delivery, like this one. And we have another picture here, and this is uh, for cargo, family. And Jamie, can you explain to us what we're looking at here? Yeah, so this is a bike from my colleague Justin Jones up in Collingwood. And this is maybe what we might refer to as a family style or cargo e-bike. And uh, it's a cargo bicycle with a basket in the front that allows you to maybe put your groceries or with a seat, your children. Um, and there's an electric assist because as you can see, it looks a little heavier than maybe a traditional bike. And especially once you get the kids and the groceries in there, it can be quite heavy, but they've got the electric assist added on here to help them get through the snow and carry that extra weight. I so it's really just showing you've shown such a great, uh, an interesting variety of vehicles with very different capacities and, you know, able to show different types of cycling throughout different climates. Um, it's great. I could have used that when my kids were smaller. We've got one more picture. And Darnell, I wanted to ask you uh, about this. What are we looking at? This is an adaptive cycle that allows the user to recline comfortably and then pedal with her feet, but also instead of using a more upright design to steer, she's be able to sit back and use her hands to steer as well. And so uh, there are many different types of cycles, and that's one of the challenges and the important and need for regulation, because, you know, many people think generally when the word bike is mentioned or cycling is mentioned, they think of an upright mountain bike. 
And there's so many different types and designs that can serve all different types of purposes. And so it's important that we have rules that allow us to talk about each of these sort of devices in the right way. And I should mention the last picture that we saw, it's a, a person who has multiple amputations. And uh, it's, um, it's incredible to have that kind of accessibility for someone with amputations, right Darnell? Yes, certainly, you know, the way that we think about these is that they are in fact mobility devices. They are devices that are able to allow people to f function, to move easily, to be able to cross their communities and be able to make an impact uh, in, a, in a very healthy way. I think when we think about mobility, we often think, oh, you have a choice between uh, a car, maybe public transit, and a bicycle. Um, but Darnell, you know, with all these different options, I'm guessing that there are different price points. So how much would an e-bike cost? It depends entirely on what you're trying to use that e-bike for. So a commercial e-bike that's made to be used constantly over the course of over the course of several years with sort of high end parts could run, you know, up to maybe 15, 16,000 a bit more. And there's options these days that are coming onto the market with refrigeration as well and other useful commercial adaptions. Generally speaking, e-bikes for the general consumer will run between around 2000 and around 10000 and you get what you pay for. But the most important thing in there is that e-bikes are in fact car replacements in that you, know, you car have that electric assist, you have cargo attachments. Mm -hmm. There's right now we have a cargo bike library, we have one of those van rams, we have a number of other bikes that allow us to be able to carry seniors in a trishaw format. And we have a number of other commercial bikes and for example, you know, FedEx, but also other companies have been using it to carry 300 kilograms of wine, meat, other sort of parcel deliveries. And it really shows the effect and having the right mobility tool allows people to achieve um, effective transport in the city. When we talk about the, uh, the cost, Jamie, obviously when uh, cars cost a lot more than what Darnell's uh, laid out there for us, uh, but do e-bikes replace traditional bicycles or cars? Right. I mean, there's been actually quite a few studies from across North America and Europe that uh, show that people are more likely to replace a car trip with an e-bike trip than they are to replace a car trip with a trip by a traditional bicycle. And, you know, that really makes sense when you look at the, you know, extra assist that you can get to carry groceries or climb that hill to your kid's school. Um, so, you know, they really can be this alternative to driving if you know in terms of climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions if people are trying to get uh, vehicle trips off the road e-bikes can really present a real solution to that um, but as you alluded to and as darnell has mentioned um, they can be fairly cost prohibitive um, in terms of you're not always replacing a car with an e-bike. So if you were thinking of buying you know a car versus a fifteen thousand dollar e-bike maybe there's a good price balance there, but not everybody who's thinking about riding an e-bike is trying to uh, replace out a car purchase. Um, and that's why several jurisdictions around the world have actually started looking at various types of rebates uh, to help people buy e-bikes and bikes We're and gonna address that uh, price barrier. We're going to touch on rebates a little uh, uh, in, in, in a little bit, but Darnell, uh, Jamie uh, mentioned climate change. How do e-bikes play into the climate change crisis? They can certainly affect our climate change pathways in a couple of ways. One, certainly they replace vans quite capably so long as you're using a micro hub system. And that really just allows us to be able to have, you know, efficient transportation at scale and transportation counts to a number of emissions. One, as we're thinking more about ecological footprint, it takes a lot more resources, lithium, iron, for example, to have a car because you're moving a lot of metal, not just yourself and your goods as well. So it's much better for the environment to actually use e-bikes and, and lighter mobility modes instead, as well as it is also significantly less drain on the power supply when it comes to charging. You don't need special charging ports. You can simply plug it into a wall outlet and be off very easily a couple of hours later or instantly if you have a spare battery, for example. 
So certainly it can make a huge difference. And it also makes a difference when people see these mobility tools and they say, yes, we feel this fits our lives. We can find a way to run our business, have our family be moved around, do whatever needs to be done on that e-bike instead. And Jamie, I think we realized this when the pandemic initially uh, hit, our need to be outside. A lot of people went outside. Um, I think for a while, you couldn't even find a bicycle. They were all sold out. Um, so many people cycle because they enjoy it, but it's also a form of exercise. Uh, do you lose that when you're riding an e-bike? Great question. And absolutely not. Riding an e-bike is still a wonderful form of exercise. And there's been research that has shown that, uh, you know, sometimes I think in the beginning, especially in North America, e-bikes were characterized as, you know, cheating. Um, and certainly, you know, the question is cheating at what? Um, unless you're, you know, racing in the Tour de France, um, where time really matters, um, and you're, you know, running daily errands, going to school, going to the grocery store, it's not really cheating, it's it's getting around. And, you know, we know that uh, e-bikes can actually help people cycle for trips that they would otherwise not be cycling for and provide them with more opportunities for exercise. But also studies show that people on e-bikes, myself included, you know, are riding further um, and actually, you know, also increasing their exercise by doing that too. So riding an e-bike can definitely be a way of getting exercise and staying healthy. Although we know that's not always the main purpose. Sometimes it's just about getting from point A to point B. Um, I think my husband would say that if I wasn't an e-bike, that I would be cheating because he's a much better cyclist than I am. But, um, you know, Darnell, even in my in my intro, I mentioned that if you are in an urban part of the province, you've probably seen an e-bike. Um, are e-bikes mainly for urban areas? No, certainly e-bikes are usable in rural areas. In fact, any area across the province. They are adaptable, especially with the wheels that you have. They're a lot lighter, so they're able to handle dirt roads, depending on the sort of wheels and attachments you have, as well as the design that you have. And they're able, they're able to be used for a variety of personal as well as commercial applications. And don't the, the big challenge really is not so much a matter of being able to use them, but a matter of being able to get a hold of one. And really, you know, speaking of climate change needs, what we need to be focusing on is how do we scale their use across the province. And Darnell, I know that you were working on a program to create safe pathways for people um, mm -hmm. in the Jane and Finch community in Toronto. Certainly, our Greenway has been working on that for a couple of years. We are currently engaging the city as well as we've built a cargo bike library, which allows people to be able to see and try e-bikes for commercial purposes, for personal purposes. We have uh, Yuba, we have a couple of turns, a couple of babos, uh, a couple of Carla trailers that allow us to really show people and allow them to understand their ability to manage their business or work with their family on those. The, the big challenge that a lot of people have, and the reason why we've been working on creating a conservancy in Northwest Toronto is a matter of having safe infrastructure that meets their needs to get from point A to point B. And Jamie? Well, I just wanted to provide a local example. Um, advocates on Manitoulin Island have actually recently gotten a grant to purchase 20 electric bicycles, um, particularly to encourage tourism and cycling tourism along the island. You know, um, Manitoulin recently opened a really long section across the entire north-south of the island along Highway 6, the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail, a wide uh, paved shoulder. And, uh, you know, they were getting some interest in people wanting to come and you know ride the bikes but were concerned about hills or the distance between communities and so they got this grant and now you know you're going to be able to take the ferry or drive to Manitoulin Island and rent an e-bike from them you know for the day or for the weekend and cycle around Manitoulin Island and experience e-biking in that environment as well so there's a lot of interest from a tourism perspective uh, in particular in rural communities about e-bikes where things might be spaced a little bit further apart. The e-bikes can really help you have that confidence to 
um, you know, fill that gap between spaces. But also if you're in a group, as you've mentioned, just being able to keep up with friends and keep up with the other people in your group, having access to that e-bike uh, and the e-bike rental could really be helpful. And it's such a calm uh, feeling to imagine yourself on a bike on Manitoulin Island. Um, but, you know, uh, Jamie Darnell mentioned the need for infrastructure. Um, can people on e-bikes legally ride in bike lanes and trails? Yeah, so this is kind of one of the potentially complicated questions that creates some confusion around e-bikes um, because different jurisdictions have different rules. So generally, yes, e-bikes are permitted to be riding on the road. You know, they're considered to be vehicles. Um, and a lot of times it's up to local municipalities to pass bylaws about where the bike e-bikes are allowed or not allowed to go. And municipalities can also further distinguish between different types of e-bikes. So at the beginning you showed, you know, a pedal assist e-bike or a throttle assist e-bike. A municipality can decide that pedal assist e-bikes are allowed on our trails, but throttle assist e-bikes are not. Um, so it is creating a little bit of complication, especially in an area like where, you know, I live or Darnell lives, very interconnected communities. I'm in Hamilton. You could cross the border to Burlington, and now there's different rules of the road of where your e-bike can go. So there's been a lot of work underway to kind of try to harmonize some of these rules and provide clearer communications, because I think especially as interest in e-bikes grows, people want that consistency, and they want to be able to know that if I spend the money on this e-bike, I'm going to be able to ride it in the places that I want to. But generally, if you have a pedal assist e-bike, you can ride it most places that a traditional bicycle can go. I'm guessing too, if you're, um, I don't want to say traditional cyclist, but if you're on a regular bikes, I'll just use that. Um, are are, are e-bikes dangerous to people who are on bikes? Do they, is there like a feeling that they might be a little bit of pushback from people who are on so-called traditional bikes? Right, yeah. Like you're saying, let's not use the term traditional bikes. Non-electric bikes is probably the better way to go. Um, so yeah, I think that is, that's a real conversation that's happening. And there's a lot of concern, especially as we get to multi-use trails where there's also pedestrians, you know, families with strollers, dogs. Um, and now you're talking about introducing a type of vehicle that could possibly go up to 32 kilometers an hour in Ontario. Um, you know, people are, are concerned about that. And if you think of some of the more crowded pieces of cycling infrastructure in downtown Toronto, like Richmond Adelaide bike lanes, you can be really concerned about that as well. And, so I think an important point when we talk about e-bikes is just because an e-bike could go up to 32 kilometers an hour doesn't mean that it will. And there's been a couple of studies out of the United States and Europe that have actually concluded the average speed of an e-bike is one to four kilometers faster than a non-electric bike. So just because you're on an electric bike doesn't mean you're on there to go as fast as you possibly can. So, you know, that element needs to be considered that, you know, a lot of people are just riding these and generally you may not be able to distinguish if somebody passes you on an e-bike or a non-electric bicycle. Um, and so not banning them outright because of an assumption that they might go faster. Um, but infrastructure design has a huge role to play in that and, you know, providing separated safe spaces for you know people walking and people cycling is really important i think as volume grows regardless of whether it's a non-electric bike or an electric bike just having more people in a lane or on a trail does make the dynamic more complicated but i think it would be an oversimplification to assume that just because it's someone on an e-bike they should be banned because they could go 32 kilometers an hour um that is not proven to be accurate in research and would really create a lot of barriers to people who need that e-bike to be out getting around. There seems to be an assumption, yeah. though, that um, e-scooters um, do, some people might get nervous around them. Is that an unfounded stereotype? Mm -hmm. I, I personally wouldn't say so. I mean, the real challenge, of course, is one of terminology, but also really one of harmonization in an important way in that often when people you say scooters they mean e-bikes or e-bikes they can mean scooters and certainly one of the pictures you showed earlier was a, a motorino bike which was in fact the subject of a bc supreme court case and then a canadian supreme court case 
and the court case was effectively over, is this a bike or is this something else? And really, this isn't just a problem for individuals. It affects them, certainly, because they have a chance of being arrested, for example, if they happen to be in the wrong place with, with the type of bike that they happen to be having. But it's a problem really across the sector. Um, one of the main reasons that we don't do, for example, production here is there's a lack of harmonized rules. Um, when you're dealing with rebates, Transport Canada you know, has some very clear rules over what constitutes a safe car, truck, snowmobile. They're nothing like that for e-bikes. And certainly, you know, this is where we need to have harmonization and clear understanding so that everyone is talking about the same thing using the same language that can be codified into law, codified into insurance, codified into manufacturing, and allow us to actually expand this at scale. Is it safe uh, to ride all year here in Ontario, Darnell, on an e-bike? Yes. I mean, you know, much like, um, of course, I said I rode, a, rode an e-bike to coffee this morning. Um, much like everything else, it's a matter of proper maintenance infrastructure. There are also winter tires for e-bikes. And so long as you have those on, it's extremely safe, even with ice and snow. In fact, you can even go over ice and snow uh, with the right bike and snow tires because it is, of course, lighter, and that allows it to glide across the surface easier. Uh, Jamie, right now you need a license to drive a car. Uh, you need one to ride a motorcycle. You don't need one to ride an e-bike. Should that change? No, I would say that um, not having a licensing system for electric bicycles makes a lot of sense. It's in line what we have for riding non-electric bicycles. Um, it opens it up to people of all ages, uh, people visiting from out of province. Um, licensing systems on bicycles have proven to be very, a big administrative burden, um, as well as exclusion exclusionary of many people. And so I think that, you know, with a lot of the stuff that's been happening in Ontario with electric bicycles, it's been about harmonizing the rules with what we have with bicycles. And so the kind of non-licensing system makes sense for both types of bicycles in this case, as we see in other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, and I know in, in Toronto, we've had this conversation around um, bike lanes. And um, when it comes to e-bikes, and we've talked a little bit about infrastructure, what does safe infrastructure for e-bikes look like, Jamie? I'd say in many ways, safe infrastructure for Riding an e-bike looks a lot like safe infrastructure for riding a bicycle, um, but I would be careful to know that that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the infrastructure that we have today. A lot of the ways that we build for people cycling, um, the infrastructure is inadequate. Um, so, you know, building these safe and separated spaces for people to ride their bikes and e-bikes is incredibly important. Uh, as Darnell mentioned, especially as we're looking at some of the larger uh, cargo e-bicycles, it's important to consider width, allowing people the space to pass each other, to account for different speeds, to cycle side by side as they are able to do in many communities in Europe. Um, you know, just creating those widths of paths and bike lanes is very important. And I think, you know, e-bikes, their popularity as well as their size really emphasize that. Um, I'd also note the importance of protection at intersections. This is often something that is lacking, um, but there has been a little bit of research that has shown that, you know, drivers can be quite... Um, taken off guard by how fast someone on an e-bike is riding. Um, and especially if it's somebody who's riding, you know, upright, they don't look like they're working very hard. A driver could assume, oh, they're going quite slow. I'm going to make this right turn. Um, and that would not be the case. So creating, um, infrastructure that really continues through the infrastructure, prioritizes people cycling, creates lots of lighted opportunities, a lot of visibility. That's important with non-electric bicycles, but I think potentially it could be even more important with electric bicycles, especially as we navigate that difference in speed um, and people not knowing how fast someone on an e-bike, they might be going just that little bit faster than they think and make that right turn. And we need to build infrastructure that prevents those types of interactions and collisions. 
We kind of talked a little bit about rebates. Uh, U.S. President Joe Biden's Build Back Better bill includes a proposed rebate for buying an electric bike, um, a third of the cost back up to $900 U.S. Does that exist in any province, Darnell? There are a number of rebate programs across the country. Electrify Nova Scotia, for example, offers a flat rebate of $500 for e-bikes railing a th retailing for 1200 and more. BC also has a number of rebates now as well. A number of different provinces are looking at it. Certainly Ontario and different municipalities in Ontario are also looking at it as well because they know it helps reduce the barriers that would allow people to access these bikes. And Jamie, I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, as Darnell was saying, it's something that has been picked up kind of on a provincial or municipal level in some places across the, the country, but nowhere in Ontario yet. Um, I've been tracking kind of government rebate programs around the world, and certainly what Darnell was talking about with, um, you know, kind of the flat rate $500 or a certain 30% percentage is the most common way that these rebates are rolled out. Um, around the world, we're starting to see a bit more creativity and openness um, in terms of doing things like providing on-site vouchers so that you don't have to pay the full cost of the e-bike up front and then wait for a rebate to come in the mail. You can actually get that rebate at the point of sale at the bike shop. Um, we're starting to see more programs, rebate programs that are scaled to income um, so that if you are lower income, the rebate can be higher than the $500. Because let's be honest, if you're buying a $3,000 bike, $500 off is very helpful, but it's still a $2,500 bike. And so more programs are starting to be scaled to income, um, as well as programs that are including all types of bicycles. Um, I know this was a question that came up in Edmonton around their program. You know, why are we rebating these very expensive bikes that are only accessible to people who can afford an ex expensive bike, but not helping people afford a three or $400 non-electric bike. And so I think more programs, particularly in Europe, are starting to expand to say, let's try to find ways to make any type of this low speed wheeled mobility more affordable. And I hope that when we have that conversation here in Canada at a federal level, we're able to adopt some of these innovative and more creative strategies around rebates. I think what we have now in different provinces is a good place to start, but there's certainly more we can do to really put these mobility tools in the hands of as many people who need them as possible and let them experience, you know, the joy and ease of riding down the street or down the trail on an electric bicycle. Darnell and Jamie, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation and I love how you call, you both call it a mobility tool um, so more people can have access to get outside. We really do appreciate your passion and knowledge. Thank you so much. Pleasure to connect thank with you. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.